And apparently we're live. Good evening, everybody. Welcome along to Live Irish Myths with Anthony Murphy of Mythical Ireland. It has uh, been a very beautiful, warm, sunny day here in Erin in Ireland after yesterday's dull, rainy day. So the good weather has returned, at least for now. It's a, a nice, bright evening out there. This evening, you're all very welcome along to episode number 47. Docket is a shock. And you might be shocked <laughs> that we've managed to go this long and we're still going. Anyway, good evening to everybody. Uh, whether you're watching on Facebook, on the Mythical Ireland page, or on the YouTube channel, tonight we are talking about Lower Gawala, or as it's commonly known, the Book of Invasions. And we're going to introduce the arrival of the Tua de Danon. There are a number of episodes to be gleaned from Lower Gawala. Uh, we've already had the story of Kazair, uh, which is entirely contained in Lower Gawala. I hope you'll find tonight's episode interesting, and there'll be lots of interaction. I personally enjoyed the last couple of episodes. I enjoyed the first open house last night. I thought we went down some deep rabbit holes, <laughs> and the episode was quite long as a result. Uh, and that's something I will be coming back to. Uh, and thank you for all your nice suggestions. On YouTube, Jack Durkin was the first commenter at 7.16 p.m. Good evening, Jack. David Ebel says, hi, Jack. Uh, well, uh, David. Er er Erica Bau says, good afternoon from Kibolo in Texas. And you're very welcome, Erica. Daisy Peter says, it's a very beautiful sunny afternoon in Rio de Janeiro. And a nice evening to you, Anthony, and everyone in Ireland. Thank you, Daisy. Falcha. Jackie Stevenson, ready for another amazing episode here in sunny California. Thank you, Anthony. And you're very welcome along, Jackie. Mandy McCurl says, hello from a sunny evening on the Isle of Mull, and I'm glad to hear that the sun, the sun is shining in uh, uh, in uh, Mull. Uh, Erica River Tree says, Bannachty o Louisville, Kentucky. Ta on I'm sure in you go heantuck. The weather today is excellent. Conus ata chak boraku. How are the Murphy household? Uh, did I spell that correctly? I think you did actually, uh, and I perhaps wouldn't be the one to ask. <laughs> but um, we're all good. We're all in good form, thankfully. Con Connor Puckles says, "Giri van ton agus tua mitflix banachti o galiv." Connor is in Galway, and banachti o lu in return. Her heard a shot. Who is Tom King? Evening, Anthony, and one and all. Hope all in good. Fettle, story time, looking forward. Nice to have you along, Tom. Brilliant stuff. Amber Lynn says, hello, Geoglitch Amber. Uh, and Amber says she's in Maryland. You're very welcome along. Fawlche. Bridge Bridgeview Media says, who is Nora Barry, says hello from Philadelphia. And uh, the Rocky Steps and all that. Wonderful to have you in the house, Bridge. Or Nora. Uh, Moore Girl, sending warm regards from a rainy day in Bozeman, Montana. Wow. We don't often get too, mon too many Montanans in the house, but you're very welcome. You can call me Elizabeth, says Moore Girl. Falsche, Geogriff, uh Elizabeth. And on Facebook, Pat Rowan is the first of tonight's watchers. Trononoa, Paul Athoric, Makara. Aaron Durrett is watching. Aaron, you're very welcome along. Donna Jean Porter says hi, Geogriff. Hello, Tua, says Pat. Jules Cousins is in the house saying hi. Geoglitch Barbara Barney. Geoglitch Barbara Katie Lennon says hello from Boston. And it's always nice to have the Bostonians along to join us with uh, the rest of the Tua for the tales. Aaron Durrett says, hail dear Tua and Anthony. Book of Invasions, yay! <laughs> John McAndrew says, good afternoon from upstate New York. Tranonoa a Nick Eska Casterton, good evening, Anthony. Hello to my two our friends, and hello to you too, Nick. Josephine Meehan, Ihoa from Dunmangal. Good evening to you, Josephine. Nice to have you along. Alex Casterton, evening, Anthony and Tua. Glad Billa is blessing you with sun. It's grim here in Albion today. Ah, it'll pass. It'll pass. You have the weather that we had yesterday. Patricia Patsy O'Malley Boyd is saying hi from sunny Antrim with a big smiley face. Jigrich Patricia. Catherine Wall McManus says hi. Falcha, Catherine, Mike, and Jeanette are in Princeton and they are in the house. Good to have you along. Brian Murphy is watching. He may or may not be related to me being a younger brother. Hmm. 
I hope he can learn something tonight. I can I can I can see some interesting family discussions taking place after this. Eva Anderson says, Hi everybody. It's finally raining in Gothenburg, which was much needed. It's been very dry in the forest. So I've mostly been sewing and ba baking today. I will make cinnamon rolls while listening to this. Fantastic. It's a pity you couldn't pass one over. But sure, anyway, maybe maybe we'll get a chance at some stage. Ralph Waldron says, Hi, think you will get us through this crisis. <laughs> I hope so. Uh Yes, me and maybe a bottle of whiskey. Jack Durkin says hi, everyone. Fall to Jack. Connors at all too. Alan Cardoso da Silva says hello, Anthony. And to uh, greetings from Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. Another Brazilian viewer this evening. Brilliant stuff. You're welcome, Alan Falcha. Yvette Tillema says hi to uh, and thank you, Anthony. You're very welcome, Yvette. Lovely to have you along as always. Kristen Gray Taggart says hello, Anthony and Tua from California. Brilliant stuff. Annie Newton says hi, folks. Diego Chani. Jennifer Foley says, hello, everyone. Jirive. My Vanway says, hi, everyone. Looking forward to this. My name is pronounced Muvanwi, by the way, Anthony. Muvanwi, with the emphasis on van. Okay, Muvanwi. Thank you for the pr uh, pronunciation correction. Thank you indeed, because I'm not familiar with how to pronounce it. Freya says, good evening, Anthony, and the lovely Tua from a rainy Sweden. So look forward to on stale. Barbara Kling says, hello, Anthony, and everyone from Vermont. Missed yesterday because I had an Irish conversation group online. Sounds fantastic. I've been catching up. Very interesting, but very long. Federica Guy says, hi, Anthony. Hi, Tua. Ciao. Federica is watching from Italy. Lovely to have you along. As always, Mariana Dunn is in an overcast. Alexandria in Virginia. Tashe Skamalach in you. Patricia Healy Sullivan says it's cloudy and cool. Almost snow here in Bakersfield, Vermont. Tell you what, you can keep the snow over on that side of the ocean. We'll keep the sun here. <laughs> Lisa Collins says, greetings from Minnesota, Giovich. Eugenia Whelan is watching. Oh, this may be a first, Eugenia. You're very welcome. Long call, fall Gerard. Melanie Lynn is watching. Hi, Melanie. Hope you're well. Maeve Fiona Callahan. Good mythical day, Anthony and all the two are brilliant stuff. Anna McHugh, greetings from Grapevine, Texas. Is that somewhere where a lot of secrets get passed along? Anna, you're very welcome. Falcha. Donna Firer says, I'm, hi, listening from Maryland. Hi, everyone. Love this global village. Donna, you're very welcome. And grab a, a stool or a pew, sit by the fire, and let's get ready for a bit of uh, conchuggers crack. Uh, Michael Murphy says it's raining in Massachusetts. I'm sorry to hear that, Michael. I hope your books are well on their way to you. Uh, fingers crossed they'll get there within the next day or two, hopefully. Melanie Lynn says, hi, hello, Anthony, and everyone. Fall to Melanie. Giagoch Anthony says, Eugenia. Gios Murugoch, Eugenia, lovely to see you. Andy Mac on Talura. Banachti orta Anton Tom Egg Fechinch ort im Mach. Oh, that's it. Imalia Achlia. Lovely to have you along, Andy. Thank you for joining us. Lorraine. Yalrug says, I finally made it to the live show. Way, yay even. Hello from British Columbia. And I'm sure uh, Eugenia and Lorraine and any of the other newcomers will get a very warm welcome from the rest of the, the, the Tua, uh, as all of the newcomers always do. But you are very welcome along to this storytelling session. Luciana Cavalcanti is listening in Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. We have a big uh, gathering from Rio de Janeiro this evening. Wonderful to have you all along from uh, Brazil across the ocean. Not to be confused with High Brazil, but Brazil may have got its name as a result of that uh, island, that mysterious island in the ocean that everybody thought was there. And when they went looking for it, they traveled all the way across the ocean and found Brazil. There you go. Kelly Sewell says, hi from Vermont, pronounced Vermont. <laughs> Hi, Kelly. Thanks for that. Louise Sherrill says, hello, Gia Glitch. Louise, nice to have you in the house. Molly Michelle Kopeski is in Minnesota. It's been another beautiful day here. Looking forward to today's episode. You're reading from one of my favorites. Nice to have you along, Molly. Fault you. Aaron Durrett is giving Lorraine a nice big welcome. As I said, that would happen. Guido Bruce is watching. Hello, Guido. Always lovely to have you along. Alan, good to see you. Okay. Yes, Dawn Hilton. Hi, Anthony. Love the title. Hopefully you'll like the content too, Dawn, and let's uh, see how it goes. But uh, thank you for that. Lucia Lucia Wayfarer is in St. Petersburg in Russia. We have somebody from Russia in the house. Fantastic stuff. Uh, Trononowa Giagic uh, Lucia. 
John Tom O'Cravach, have you ever lectured in Maynooth? No, but I've lectured in Princeton University, New Jersey, ironically. Laura McCormick, Falcher to the Mythflix tour, looking forward to Unfold Legends. Sunny in Kilkenaul. Is that how I pronounce that? Laura, it's lovely to have you along. Katrina is in the house on Kriach. Ta Golor Dina Dina Lagelga on show is my shin. There's a lot of people who are speaking so or trying to speak some Irish in their comments, which is brilliant. Uh, Katrina says, Yes, absolutely. Margaret Ring is in the house. Giagic, Margaret, hope you are well. David Gilroy is also in the house. Hello, David. Nice to see you this evening. In from Ah Bui in Kundanami. Evening all. Going out on a limb here, Anton. What do you make of the two a day going to war with the Anunnaki? Oof. Um, who, who are the Anunnaki? <laughs> Not something I'm very familiar with, unfortunately. Yeah, Eugenia is being asked by Erin, where does she hail from? She's from Drogheda, my own hometown. Roisin O'Connor Lawrence says hello, Jiglitch. The other David Gilroy is watching. David. David the second, you're very welcome. Uh, Yvette says snow across the pond in Keene, New York. I uh, was just saying to the snow or snowy states of New York, you can keep it that side of the Atlantic if you don't mind. We'll keep our sunshine. De we God knows we don't get enough of it generally. Deborah Alland is saying hello from Rainy, Wisconsin, and looking forward to a story. Falls you, Deborah. Mark Ledger. Morning, Anthony. 5:07 a.m. in a tropical Townsville, North Australia. Well. Uh, Majin, Majin Ma Mark, and you're very, very welcome along. Always lovely to have the early morning Australians in the house, the ridiculous o'clock people, the people for whom it should still be the middle of the night. Philo Kernunos Nichols says hello from Smithville, Tennessee. Sorry. Brilliant stuff. Nice to have you along, Philo. Catherine Purcell is in Kildare. Fall to Catherine. Sean Fitzgerald says, always look forward to Mythflix. Sean, it's a wonderful pleasure to have you along. Paul Garron says, hi, pull up a seat indeed. Hi, Paul, how are you? Slauncher from the Netherlands says, Pamela Walters, it is King's Day today here, which means the birthday of our king. Everybody is wearing something orange, representing the noble family of orange. Brilliant stuff, Pamela, and you're very welcome to the stories. Jim Conway is in Lurgan. Uh, Falcha, Jim, nice to see you as always. Kirsten Salisbury. Hi, all rain and hummingbirds in my corner of the world. Fantastic stuff. We don't see hummingbirds. Plenty of bumblebees around at the moment. Uh, Andrea Lagoya says, ciao, ciao, Andrea. Liam Smith. Evening, Anthony and co. Falcha, Liam. Falcha. Rob Bostel says, blessings. Is that Bostel Says, blessings from New England. Rob Falcha, and I'm not sure if you've been with us before. If you haven't, you're very welcome along and you'll get a lovely Cade meal of Falcha from all the Tua, from the tribe. Heather Geron Rice says, I made it again. It's mid-afternoon here. Hi, Heather, and uh, it's wonderful to see you again, even if it is this time uh, on the opposite side of a screen or a camera rather than in person at the monuments. Kristen Gray Taggart says, Falcha to all the new Tua folks, and they'll be made very welcome. Bara o Murahi it says Tranona wa gach dinna Tranona wa Bara uh, Barry that surname is that a variant uh, is that like O Murray but it's a variant of Murphy isn't it There's a lot of different uh, sort of variants of maybe it's not but anyway if I'm speaking nonsense feel free to slap me and throw me out Jack Durkin says stay safe everyone absolutely Brett Morningstar says, oh, I love the Book of Invasions. Wait, that sounded bad. <laughs> Don't worry. Barbara Murphy says, lovely to listen and to escape the 100 degrees temperature in Tucson in Arizona. Wow. So it's hot out there and probably dry as well. Killinall in County Tip says, Laura McCormick, you're very welcome along, L Laura uh, Falcha. Kimberly Sparks says it's a good, uh, says a good day from Alberta in Canada. Falcha more, Kimberly. Uh, Rowan Grove is tuning in late from sunny Colorado, working in the garden, listening to the birds and lost track of time. Well, that's what happens when you step on a stray sod. Rowan, you're very welcome. Henry says, sorry, I missed last night. Don't worry, Henry. You've been along to almost everyone and you can watch it on the video anyway, so there's no problem. Herma Klassen says, Jigwich is us on Ischilcher May August Tome Egtnules. 
Lesh, I really like the live Irish mints. Brilliant. Uh, Fault Je Herman, the uh, Coromagot. Jack Turk and Ridiculous O'Clock. Carol Barris is saying hi from Goliath. Uh, hi from Galway. Hello there. Just making sure I'm not. Lucy Robinson. Devon checking in for the second evening in a row. Brilliant stuff, Lucy. Lovely to see you. What time are we on? 15 minutes. Wow. Nancy Nee Hannifin says, Jirich Um, I, Nancy, it is very nice to have you in the house. Ka Katrina says, no slapping allowed. <laughs> Katrina will tell me whether you're supposed to... Uh, uh, is that... Uh, that's not Lenition, that's Eclipsis, isn't it? Are you supposed to put a, 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 an Eclipsis on the front of a place name like Boston? Or should it have the M in front of the B or not? That is the question. Nancy, fudge it. You're very, very welcome. Right. And on YouTube, catching up on the rest of them. Uh, Deborah Danhauer says hi from Nashville in Tennessee. Hope all are safe and well. We're keeping good on this side. Deborah, it's very nice to have you along. 7-7 seven, seven says ancient history is far more exciting than current history. Which is interesting because history is always in the past, isn't it? <laughs> I know what you mean, though. I know what you mean. Mythological history is even more interesting. John Main says, Banachthi a San Francisco, Dunahua. And I wonder what the weather's like today, John. Hopefully, the recent uh, warm spell in San Francisco uh, or sunny spell is continuing. Philip Egan, me too. Finally made it to the live session just in time for the arrival of the tour. Yay. Philip, you're very, very welcome along. Uh, Folger. Tiffany Kimmery says, Hello from North Carolina. Tiffany, Keith, and Stephen. Love your videos. Well, hi, Tiffany, Keith, and Stephen. Jérive uh, Golaire uh, and Fauci. Grab a seat. Grab a, a brew, a cup of tea, or if you want something stronger, by all means, pour yourself a dram and sit down and make yourself comfortable. J. O. U. Arish, Jérich, O. Ben Ether, and uh, uh, I can't remember your name again, J, um, is in Hoth in County Dublin. Ta on Tronona Gahalan. Yes, it is indeed a lovely evening. Ta on Greening Tatnev, August Tashe Sov. Yes, the sun is shining and it is nice and uh, sov. Is that comfortable, warm, uh, balmy? Again, hello from Hoth. The evening is beautiful, the sun is shining and it's calm, calm sov. Of course, colour sov. Yes, a calm sleep. Rosalie Reavers has finally managed to catch you live. Hi from the Wirral. Rosalie, you are one of uh, a whole rake of new viewers tonight who haven't been along before i hope you find yourself made very welcome on this uh, live irish myths john main says sunny today but cool yesterday yeah kind of like the way we had it we had, we had rain yesterday and cloud oh boston in mostun kaijin says no m so i say feck them they will not deprive of, of us of our urus regional dis discrimination right fair enough let's in other words, it's down to your personal tastes. Fair enough. That's the way to have it. Patricia McAteer is watching. Good to have you along, Patricia. Hope you're keeping well. So just take a note of that. Uh, 18 minutes and 20 seconds. So when I upload the YouTube video, I can put that if you want to skip all the for those who are coming in afterwards. Now, I'm going to. So let's introduce, first of all, what is the Book of Invasions? The Book of Invasions is, in fact, called Lower Gawala Aaron, and that doesn't actually directly mean the uh, uh, the Book of Invasions. What it actually means is the Book of the Takings of Ireland. Lower Gawala is an Irish title for the 20th, sorry, the 20th century, <laughs> skipping eight centuries there, for the 12th century text, usually known in English as the Book of Invasions or Book of Conquests, literally Book of the Taking of Ireland, a collection of pseudo-historical texts by various authors of different periods, arranged in a pattern of invasions. The Lower Gawala purports to synchronize myths, legends, and genealogies from early Ireland with the framework of biblical Jesus. In the words of Alwyn and Brinley Rees, it is, quote, a laborious attempt to combine parts of the native teaching with Hebrew mythology embellished with medieval legend, unquote. One modern commentator calls the Lower Gawala a, quote, masterpiece of muddled medieval miscellany, unquote. Compilers of the Lower Gawala do not demonstrate a profound knowledge of the Bible itself, 
but rely instead on biblical commentators and historians, especially Eusebius, Eusebius, sorry, Eusebius, 3rd century AD, Orosius, 6th century, and Isidore of Seville, 7th century. Informed by Latin learning, the surviving Irish text may have been based on a Latin original, an assertion now much disputed. Portions of the Irish text were contributed by a number of identifiable poets from the 9th and 10th centuries, the final compilation coming after the 11th. Accepting biblical cosmology, the Laura Gawala plays a role in the Irish mythological cycle compared to that of Hesiod's Works and Days, 6th century BC, in Greek mythology. And of course, as we found out, the book begins with the biblical flood and connects the beginnings of Ireland's story with the Bible by bringing here to the shores of Ireland the woman who we dealt with, uh, her story, we told her story in one of the very early, um, uh, to find out exactly now when we when we told it, number 13, episode 13, Kezair, the first woman in Ireland, who, according to Laura Gawala, Aaron, was none other than the granddaughter of Noah, he who built the ark, he who loaded all the animals in two by two and survived the wrath of God, the wrathful vengeance of God, who had sent a great deluge to cover the earth and drown all the bold and naughty and sinful people. So there were six invasions in chronicled in the book of invasions. So it begins with Kazair and then it moves on to Partholon. Partholon, as we alluded to, and that's one we will do an episode on, in the future, uh, the Par Partholon and all his people died of a plague and are, are, were all buried at a place called Tala Muncha Partholon, which is now known as Tala in Dublin. That's T-A-L-L-A-G-H-T. Uh, this is followed by Nemed, or the Nemedians, who came from the Caspian Sea 30 years after the death of Partholon. Uh, followed, uh, although not part of an invasion se sequence, the Fomorians, uh, are, are, are sort of the ever-present uh, dark deities, the dark side of the force who are ever-present. The Fir Bullug or the Fir Volug uh, are next. They are a dark people who come to Ireland fleeing oppression, and we will do an episode on their uh, portion of the Book of Invasions. And then, of course, follows uh, the um, the Tua, the Danon, which we're dealing with now, that is Section 5, and they are followed by uh, Mil España, or his sons rather, the sons of the, the king of Spain, the Milesians, Eramon, Eber, Don, uh, and Amargin, or Amargin. Uh, and of course, th the Milesians and Amargin uh, are going to require, I, I would imagine, t at least two episodes. We also have to cover Skota, which is included under the uh, umbrella of the Milesians. And uh, I know Maureen O'Leary wanted us to do uh, an episode about Skota, which is coming eventually. Uh, I just need to do more research, which I promise I will do. If I, if I stay well and safe and all that, and I have the time, I will do it. Um, so we're going to start tonight with the arrival of the Tuatha Now, if you have never sort of referred back to the source material, uh, you may not be familiar with some of the little intricate details of the story of the arrival of the Tuatha de Danann. You may have read it or uh, seen it claimed in a modern day uh, work of <clears throat> nonfiction. Uh, where there's a constant reference to the fact that the Tuatha de Danann arrived out of the sky and therefore they were an alien race. Uh, and you'll see some very um, far-fetched uh, and interesting and entertaining claims around that uh, because of that. But if you read the actual text, it becomes clear as to why it was thought that they might have come from the sky. Now, I can read some of the introductory notes uh, so tonight I'm going to be reading from the Irish Text Society's uh, Laura Gawala Aaron Part uh, 4, uh, which is translated by R.A.S. McAllister. McAllister was a, a scholar uh, and uh, an antiquarian and a bit of an archaeologist, uh, a bit of an all-round genius, a polymath, uh, really. Uh, and uh, R.A.S. stands for R.A. Stuart McAllister. Uh, and this volume was originally published, I think, in 1941. 
Yes, first published 1941, reprinted 1987, 97, and 2009. If you're interested in getting uh, the Irish Text Society translations of Laura Gowala, uh, they are available on the Irish Text Society website. Just Google it. Now, they may not be del delivering at the moment uh, during the... Uh, the lockdown uh, so maybe check that first there are several redactions as it were because uh, Laura Gowala comes to us from several different manuscript sources uh, and so there are actually three uh, redactions I'm going to start with the first and see how we get on uh, and I'll make some commentary as we head along um, the introductory notes are actually quite comprehensive they might even make uh, an entire episode on their own at some stage, you know. Uh, now, it's a little bit scholarly, so we'd probably have to skip over a little some of it. Um, I'll just, for instance, give you the, the first paragraph of the introduction. And good evening to you. If you've just joined us, um, we're just about to start on our uh, exploration of uh, Laura Gawala, uh, the section dealing with uh, the Tua de Dan. Actually, although this is um, part four of the series of volumes, uh, the section dealing with Tua de Danon is, is actually section seven. That's very interesting. Uh, Henry Scullion says, Anthony, I use the Tua de Danon mythology for a comic I am doing, Captain Shamrock and the Red Hands, and I have them crash landing in Ireland thousands of years ago. I must send you some of my art. Henry, I'd love to see that. That sounds fascinating. Uh, Catherine Purcell is saying it's Lauer. Oh, am I pronouncing it wrong? Lauer. Uh, yeah. Um, so so don't be confused. Uh, 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 Lebor, or it would be Lenited, Lauer. This is the old Irish, right? So we we we. Um, uh, we speak, or, well, some of us are trying to speak. <laughs> uh, modern Irish is slightly different. Uh, there have been changes. Uh, so when you see L-E-B-O-R, that is the old Irish or the early Irish uh, version of Lauer. Uh, and uh, there'll be several other words likewise. Beyond all doubt, this section is based upon a theogonia, most likely uh, transmitted orally, less probably in writing, in which the mutual relationships of the members of the pre-Christian pantheon were set forth. Unfortunately, for the value of the compilation as a mythological handbook, the humorist has run amok uh, among these ancient deities. He has been desperately anxious to incur no suspicion of propagating not quite forgotten heathenisms. And in consequence, this, in many ways, the most important section in the whole book, has become reduced to an arid list of names. And, and basically what he's trying to say there is that this was originally a story about the ancient gods. And what happened was that the, the medieval scribes, when they got their hand on it, were very anxious to, to make sure that people understood that the two out of Danon weren't in fact deities because they, were, they would be pre-Christian pagan deities and would therefore challenge the authority of the one true God, you know, of Christianity. What they basically tried to do was to make them humans and to give them human genealogies uh, and link them to each other through complex uh, and, and, and very uh, contrived genealogies is basically what he's trying to say. Anyway, we'll go to the, we'll go to the beginning. So this is the first redaction. Thereafter, the progeny of Behach, uh, son of Yarbonel, the soothsayer, son of Nemed, were in the northern islands of the world, learning druidry and knowledge and prophecy and magic, till they were expert in the arts of pagan cunning. So this is the, the beginnings, as it were, of the two of the Dan. Hang on till I just make sure I'm up, up to speed. Aaron Eckhard says, hello, a little late. Geogrich, Aaron, never, better late than never. Uh, and it's good to have you along. There were four cities in which they were acquiring knowledge and science and diabolism. <laughs> so you can bet your bottom dollar that that word is an insert by the scribe, <laughs> you know. These are their names. Phalias, F-I-A-L-I-A-S, 
Gorias, G-O-I-R-I-A-S, Findias, F-I-N-D-I-A-S, and Murias, M-U-I-R-I-A-S. Now, I think instantly they are names that are interesting because uh, Foil is like destiny, isn't it? Uh, Leo Foil. Uh, Find is like uh, knowledge, you know, Find, uh, Buvinda, Find, Makul, etc. Uh, the old Irish for Finn is uh, F I N D. And Muriash, uh, I think Mur relating to the sea. Am I right or am I wrong? Katrina may have uh, some input on that one. From Folius was brought the Leofoil, which is in Tower and which used to utter a cry under every king that should take Ireland. So here we have uh, in the uh, basically in the second paragraph of se section seven of Laura Gawala, uh, the claim that the Leofoil, the coronation stone of Tara, was in fact brought to Ireland from the northern isles of the world uh, by the Tua de Danon, and specifically from four cities in which they were acquiring all sorts of uh, knowledge and science and diabolism. F uh, Folum, uh, learning. Fish, which is knowledge. Agus Olus, uh, which is learning. Uh, Agus Giabalachtach, uh, <laughs> which is that diabolism. So the wonderful thing about uh, R.A.S. McAllister's uh, uh, translation in the uh, Irish Text Society volumes is that always on the left you have the Irish and always on the right you have the English. So if, for instance, you're a scholar of Irish, and lots of Gaelgores are who read this, and you're not entirely sure where this word came from, you can refer to the Irish and you can say, oh, OK, right. Um, yeah, but that could also mean X, Y and Z, you know. So none of the translations are perfect. Morgan Daimler, who we had on an episode uh, about the Morrigan's role in Katmai Chura, uh, uh, had some criticisms, and I think they were justified, of the extant scholarly translations of the Second Battle of Moitura. At the moment, at this very moment, she is endeavouring to translate the whole thing because the, 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 uh, the Irish text has not be com been completely translated into the English because some of it is very obscure and uh, deemed untranslatable by previous scholars. But Morgan is going to make an effort to translate the whole lot. Anyway, I digress. See how easy it is to go off on a tangent. So from Folius was brought the Leofoil, which is in Tower. That's Tara which used to utter a cry under every king that should take Ireland. From Goiriash, is that how I'm pronouncing it? I don't know, Katrina might help me. From Goriash was brought the spear which Lou had. So this is Lou, law father Lou Samuel Domach, who presents himself at Tara during Kahmai Chura to uh, offer his services to Nuadu and ends up being uh, terrifically uh, important, centrally important, him and Morrigan, by the way, uh, to the winning of the uh, Battle of Moitura for the Dedanans against the Fomorians. Battle would never go, go against him who had it in hand. In other words, if you had Lou's spear in your hand, you could never be defeated in battle. From Findius was brought the sword of Nuadu. No man would escape from it. When it was drawn from its battle scabbard, there was no resisting it. And so Nuadu was the aforementioned king of the Tua de Danon at the time of the first battle of Moitura when he had his, his arm chopped off by Shreng, the warrior of the Fir, the Fir Volug. He had to uh, vacate the throne, abdicate, whatever you want to call it, resign because he had a blemish. Bress took over and Bress had significant Fomorian blood and everything fell asunder under his reign. Uh, <clears throat> <clears throat> note common <clears throat> modern western democracies oh excuse me sorry just uh, uh had a slight cough in my throat there and um uh, uh dean kecht the healer and his son meach uh, fashioned a new arm for nuadu uh, dean kecht's version was made of silver and meach put flesh on it and hence nuadu was called silver arm and he was able to regain the kingship of ireland uh, for the second battle of moitura against the fomorians yet again i have gone on a significant tangent off the story Please let me continue. From Muriash 
was brought the cauldron of the Dagda, which we have discussed uh, in several episodes. No company would go from it unsatisfied. And that was the one, wasn't it, that was called the Undry, because it was always uh, full of uh, nice uh, food and broth and drink. There were four sages in these cities. Morfessa, M-O-R-F-E-S-A. And I wonder whether that means, is that is that like a corruption, Katrina, of more Fassa, uh, great knowledge, who was in Phalius, Esrus, E-S-R-U-S, in Gorius, Usicius, U-S-I-C-I-A-S, and I'm probably making a hames of that uh, pronunciation, in Findias, and Semias, S-E-M-I-A-S, in Murius. Those are the four poets with whom the Tua de Danon acquired knowledge and science. And so quite regularly, when you see names in early Irish myths, the names actually have a meaning. They're not just names. Like Aurgin, that we spoke about. Amargin, Aurgin Glungial, possibly meaning birth of song, him being the first poet of the Milesians. So here's what happens, right? And I'm just going to show you this. The text actually splits regularly into two columns. Uh, where it, it Previously, it has been one. It breaks into two. And that's because there are different versions of the tale in different manuscripts. So um, I, I'm going to try and stick with the one that's more comprehensive in each case. Uh, but as I said, forgive me, because I, I, I understand we have a lot of ground to cover in a short time. If you wish to explore all the versions, of course, you can either purchase a copy yourself, or I believe the whole thing is online. Uh, and I think that, uh, is that what you're sharing there, Katrina? Um, Leah Foyle, Jules Cousins, wants to know what that is. That is uh, the coronation stone upon which the king of Tara was uh, was uh, uh, crowned or inaug inaugurated. Uh, but there's lots about that online. Thereafter, the Tua de Danon came to Ireland. So they were in the northern isles of the world, learning great knowledge and druidry. Uh, there were four cities uh, 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 where specifically they learned this knowledge. There were four great items that they brought with them. And there were four druids from whom they learned all this knowledge. And then they came to Ireland. Their origin is uncertain, whether they were of demons or of men. But it is said that they were of the progeny of Bjohok, son of Yerbonel the giant. Now, uh, uh, again, uh, this is uh, a humorism uh, on the part of the scribe who's basically trying to make them human because he's not at all comfortable with the fact that they were deities. In this wise they came, without vessels or barks, in dark clouds over the air, by the might of druidry, and they landed on a mountain of Conmac Narain in Connacht. And that's C O N M A I C N E, Conmacna Rain, or E I N in Connacht. That is, on the mountain of the sons of Delgi, D E L G A I D, in Conmacna Rain, that is, Conmacna Cullia. Another company says that the Tua de Danon came in a sea expedition and that they burnt their ships thereafter. It was owing to the fog of smoke that rose from them as they were burning that others have said that they came in a fog of smoke. So there you go. That was the whole idea of them uh, arriving in the mist. It was more like a, a, a smoky fog because they had burned their ships. Not so, however, for the, there, these are the two reasons why they burnt their ships, that the Fomori should not find them, that's the Fomorians, to rob them of them, and that they themselves should have no way of escape from Ireland, even though they should suffer rout before the Fir Volug. In other words, that they shouldn't turn into cowards and run for the ships and flee at the first sign of trouble. That's why they burned their ships. Thereafter, the Tua de Danon brought a darkness over the sun for a space of three days and three nights. So despite the efforts I hope I'm pronouncing that word right. Yeah, you you humorized or you you humorism is where you know uh, the the uh, the person telling the story is basically trying to make the story uh, sound like it's based on real human events. Uh, now, uh, despite this. 
uh, I tell you what, you'd want to be some powerful human, wouldn't you? To be able to bring a darkness over the sun for the space of three days and three nights. They demanded battle or kingship of the Fir Vulg. A battle was fought between them, to wit, the first battle of my Chura. Cage Cha my Chura, which is in the Irish. And they were a long time fighting that battle, and it went against the Fir Vulg. And the slaughter pressed northward. And a hundred thousand of them were slain from Maitura to the strand of Yohal the right. Uh, so uh, a very, very, very great uh, uh, defeat uh, for the Fir Vulug. Somebody else is commenting there about uh, declaration of no retreat. Do or die, isn't it, says Henry. Yes. Uh, now, this this may indeed have been influenced by uh, medieval and, and uh, uh, Middle Age uh, uh, um, beliefs, I was going to say, um, you know, doctrines that held that, you know, when you went into a battle uh, on behalf of your tribe, uh, there was no cowardice uh, and that uh, you would be proud to uh, to suffer a warrior's death if that's what was to happen to you, if you were to die, uh, that you wouldn't be a, a you wouldn't be afraid at all, you know. There, Yochi, son of Urk, was overtaken, and he fell there at the, at the hands of the three sons of Nemed, which is interesting because Nemed is the uh, progenitor of the Nemedians, son of Baura, namely, namely Kesarv, Lo, Loch, and Lochra. So Yochi, son of Urk, or Yochi Mach Urk, was, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, the king of the Fir Volug, or the leaders of the Fir Volug. Howbeit the two of the Danon suffered heavy loss in the battle. Sounds like a race memory of the aftermath of a meteor strike or volcanic eruption, the sun blackening, says Henry. Yeah, very uh, interesting suggestion, interesting possibility. Everyone who's, who escaped of the Fir Volug and any of them who had no desire to be in servitude to the Tua de Danon went out from Ireland in flight and came to Ara and Islay and Racha and Man and islands in the sea besides. They were in those islands till the time when the provincial kings ruled Ireland and the Crutnia drave them out of the islands. Thereafter, they came to Corpora Niafer and he gave them land, but they could not remain with him for the severity of the tax which was imposed upon them. Thereafter, they went in flight from Corpora under the protection of Maeve and Elil and gave them land. That is the wandering of the sons of Umor, U-M-O-R, Angus son of Umor, and that's Angus spelt the same way as Angus Oak, was king over them in the east, and from them are named the territories, to wit, Luch Kime, from Kime, the four-headed son of Umor, it was named, and Rind Tawan in Medriga, from Tawan, and the fort of Angus in Ara, from Angus, and the stone heap of Connell in the territory of Ainya, from Connell, and Mag Adar, or Ar, from Ar, and Mai Asal in Mumu, further from Asal, blah, 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 blah. Uh, and that is basically a side tale as to what happened, those who escaped the Fir Bullock and who did not want to remain in Ireland under the servitude of the uh, Tour de Danon. It is the Tour de Danon who brought with them the great fall, F-A-L, that is the stone of knowledge, which was in Chower or Tara, whence Ireland bears the name of the Plain of Fall. So one of the old poetic names from mythology for Ireland was, um, uh, what, is, what is it in, in uh, let me just get it here in, uh, in the Irish. But I think the D would be lenited. He whom, under whom it should utter a cry was the King of Ireland until Cúchulain smote it, for it uttered no cry under him, nor under his fosterling, Louis, son of the three fins of Awen. 
And from that out, the stone uttered no cry, save under Con of Chower. And that's Con of the Hundred Battles, one of the famous kings of Tara. Then its heart flew out from it, from Chower, to Talchu. So that is the heart of Fall, which is there. It was no chance which caused it, but Christ's being born, which is what broke the power of the idols. So again, you can see the devious hand of the scribe, the Christian scribe, trying to change the story. And basically what he's saying is that the, the plane of, the, sorry, the stone of fall, the Leofoil at Tara, which screamed under every rightful king, would not scream under Cúchulainn. And Cúchulainn smote it, uh, hit it or whatever, struck it with a sword, and it never gave out a cry again. And further from that, its heart flew out from it, uh, from Chower to Chalchu, uh, to Talchu, from, from Tara to Teltown, uh, home of the, uh, the Irish Olympic Games, as it were. So that is the heart of fall, which is there. It was no chance which caused it, but Christ's being born. And that is undoubtedly an insertion by the scribe. Now, again, it splits into two columns and they're of equal length. Uh, Eeny, meeny, miny, mo, I think. Oh, okay, we'll go with the right one. Nuadu Arigatlov. And that means Nuadu of the silver arm, because of the aforementioned arm of silver that was made from him by Diem Kecht. He it is who was king over the Tuatha de Danann for seven years before their coming into Ireland, till his arm was cut off from him in the first battle of Maichura. Or Magchurid, as it's spelt, if you want to just, just say exactly what's there. Edlio, son of Aldui, he is the first man of the Tuatha de Danann who fell in Ireland. That's E D L E O. Mach Aldui, A L D O I. He was the first man of the Tuatha de Danann who fell in Ireland at the hands of Nerchon Ua Semyon. In the first battle of Moitura, there fell Urnmas and Echtak and Ethergal and Fiachna. <coughs> Although it did say earlier that there were great losses uh, to the Dedanans. I, I, I'm sure it's not going to go into an exhaustive list of the casualties. Bress, son of Elada, took the kingship of Ireland thereafter to the end of seven, seven years. This is the reign of Bress, which is recounted in more detail in uh, the story caught Maitura, the second battle of Maitura, uh, which we have already referred to in one of our episodes, but which we will go back to. Until the arm of Nuadu was healed. Thereafter, Nuadu Aragatlov, 20 years. He had an arm of silver with the full activity of any arm in each finger and in each joint, which Dian Kecht the leech put upon him, Krejna the right, giving him help. And where you see leech, uh, a, a better translation is physician uh, or healer. But Mech, son of Dian Kecht, fixed joint to joint and vein to vein of his own hand, and it was healed in thrice nine days. Very interesting number that, thrice nine, 27, which is a lunar number. And on that account, his silver hand was given as his guerdon, G-U-E-R-D-O-N. And I need to look that up because I don't know what that means. <laughs> Uh, anybody know what Guerdon means? A reward or recompense. There you go. As for Talchu, daughter of my Mor, or Magmor, king of Spain, queen of the Fervolog, she came after the slaughter was inflicted upon the Fervolog in the first battle of Moitura to Coil Coen, uh, that is the wood of Coen, and the wood was cleared by her. So it was a flowering cover, clover plain before the end of a year. This is that Talchu, who was wife of Yohu, son of Urk, king of Ireland, until the Tua de Danann slew him. That is, in other words, uh, Yohi Mac Urk, who was the king of the Fir Volug at the time of the arrivals, uh, the arrival of the de Danans. But what it appears to be saying is Talchu, who was Lu's foster mother, was a uh, daughter of the king of Spain, and she was queen of the Fir Volug. It is Yohu, son of Urk, who took her from Spain, from her father, Magmor, or Mymor, the slow king of Spain. <laughs> I don't know why he's called slow. <laughs> As for Talchu, she settled in Talchu and slept with Yohu Garub, son of Duigal 
of the two of the Danon and Cian, son of Dian Hecht, otherwise called Skal Balb, gave her his son in fosterage, namely Lou. So there you go, uh, Lou's foster mother, told you. Ethna, daughter of Balor, the strong smiter, was his mother. That is Lou. Uh, Ethna is Lou's mother. And, and uh, Lou was basically Balor's grandson. And there was a prophecy, of course, that we I think we discussed previously, that uh, Balor's grand, own grandson would kill him in battle. Thereafter, Talchu died in Talchu, and her name was imposed on the place. And it is her grave, which is northeast from the seat of Talchu. And the games were made every year by Lou, a fortnight before Lunasa, and a fortnight after Lunasa. Lunasa, the assembly of Lou, son of Ethna, is the name of the games. And at some point in the not too distant future, we will do an entire episode on the Talchin games. Uh, and I think I showed you uh, last night, uh, I think uh, we, we, we mentioned uh, Enoch Talchu, uh, or Enoch Talchin. Uh, and uh, we will uh, cover that and, and, and maybe get to talk more in detail about that conversation we started last night uh, in terms of what sort of games one might play in a henge and what activities might have been involved in these great assemblies. Sorry, I'm after losing my place now. Oh yeah, so Lunasa, uh, in other words, the Nasa of Lu, the assembly of Lu, son of Ethna, is the name of the games. The Lunasa games. Nuadu Aragadlov fell in the last battle of Moitura, that's the second battle of Moitura, and Macha, daughter of Ernmas, by the hand of Balor, the strong smiter. In that battle there fell Ogma, son of Eladan, son of Nech, at the hands of Indech, son of Daedaunan, king of the Favora. That's king of the F Indech, son of uh, Daedaunan, king of the Fomorians. Brunya and Cosmail fell at the hands of Ochtralach, son of Ninyach. After the slaying of Nuadu and of these men of that battle, the Tuadadanan gave the kingship to Lu, and his grandfather Balor fell at his hands with a stone from his sling. Uh, and this is uh, something that's recalled in more detail in my own book, uh, Island of the Setting Sun, in which we explored the uh, astronomy underlying uh, the uh, the great uh, defeat of Balor by, by Lu. Now many were slain in that battle, and Bress along with them. That is, he was the one who took over the kingship after Nuadu's arm had been chopped off in the first battle of uh, Moitura. Not many were slain in that battle, and Bress along with them. Sorry, now many were slain in that battle, and Bress along with them. As said Indech, son of as said Indek, son of man skilled in arts and scientists, science says when Lu asked of him, what is the tally of those who fell in that battle of Maitura? Seven men, seven score, seven hundreds, seven fifties, or nine hundreds, twenty forties, ninety, including the grandson of Net, <laughs> that is, including Ogma, son of Elathan, son of Net. Wow. In some interesting figures in there, and I know that there are some interesting theories about what those figures might mean, maybe something for exploration in the future. Lu, son of Ethnu, or Ethna, was 40 years in the kingship of Ireland after the last battle of Moitura. There were 27 years between these two battles. Uh, so um, Nuadu was said to have reigned for a total of 20 years. Lu, after him, was said to have reigned as the king of the Tua de Danon for 40 years. Yochu Olahar, that is the great Dagda, son of Elada, 80 years in the kingship of Ireland. <clears throat> so we're seeing an exponential increase in the term or the length of the term of the king. Uh, Nuadu, 20 years. Lu, 40 years. Uh, Yochu Olahar or the Dagda, 80 years. Does that mean that the next king served for 160 years? <clears throat> over him did the men of Ireland make the mound of the brew, and over his three sons, Angus, A, and Kermud Coin. Uh, and so here 
uh, is, is is something that's that is very very important, and that is that Laura Gawala uh, goes against the grain uh, of the tale which is called the Gawal in Shida, the distribution or the taking Gawal Gawala, the taking of the uh, other world mounds, because in that story. Dogda is credited as building all the mounds for the Dedanans. And indeed, he is the builder of Newgrange and its first owner. He is the builder of the brew. And yet, here we have in Laura Gawala the suggestion that uh, over the Dogda did the men of Ireland make the mound of the brew and over his three sons. Now, uh, I, I'm assuming that that is suggesting uh, over his remains <laughs> after he had died perhaps that's not what it means it might not be that explicit you know and and and, and the other so again there are side by side translations here from slightly different versions then yahu olahar the great dagda son of elada was 80 years in the kingship of ireland his three sons were angus and a and kermit coim the three sons of dean kecht ku and kehan and kian so that other version does not mention that the men of ireland made the mound of the brew uh, over the Dagda and his three sons. Dian Kecht had four sons, Ku, Cian, Kehan, and Miach, and Etan, the poetess, well, I presume that's Etain, or a version thereof, and Carpre, son of Etan, the poet, and Aramid, the she-leech, was another daughter to Dian Kecht. In other words, the female physician. Uh, so even back in... Uh, in the misty, hoary past of pre-Christian Ireland, uh, uh, there was no sexism. Uh, 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 there's, there, women could be doctors as well as men. There you go. Which, which uh, may maybe might help to um, mitigate some of the abject uh, sexism and downright abysmal treatment of women that we've encountered in some of the stories. Crickenbell and Brunia and Koshmail were the three satirists. Bechwila and Dianon were the two she farmers. So there you go. Ban Tuahig uh, is the Irish. T U F A T H A G I G. Two she farmers. The three sons of Kermaj, son of the Dagda, were Makol, Makecht, and Magrania. Son of the hazel, son of the plough, I think Kecht is, and son of the sun, S U N, are what those names actually mean. Makol, Makecht, and Magrania. And of course, we will later find when we deal with the uh, section of Lower Gawala dealing with the arrival of the Milesians, we will see how each of those kings was killed by uh, one of the Milesian brothers. Makol, Makecht and Magrania, son of the hazel, son of the plough, son of the sun. Sehor and Tehor and Kehor were their three names. And again, there may be some relevance to that, which we can explore. Perhaps some some of the Gaelgor, some of the Irish speakers can explore. Sehor, S-E-T-H-O-R, Tehor, T E T H O R and Kehor, C E T H O R. Fotla or Fola and Bamba and Eru were their three wives. And we will meet these uh, trip, trip, triplicate divinities uh, again because we will be talking very much about them in our episode. We're going to do an episode on Ishnak. We're going to do a separate episode on Eru uh, and the triplicate, uh, what you would call the tutelary or the guardian goddesses of Ireland when the Milesians arrived. Fea, F-E-A, and Nemange, N-E-M-A-I-N-D, were the two wives of Nech, uh, Aquo Alyak Nech. Fleas, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to make sure I got the uh, Lenition, so I may be making mistakes. Phlegius or Fleas, of whom is the cattle of Fleish. Her four daughters were Argon and Beikhule and Dinand and Behing, Beheche, T-H-E-I-T-E. The two royal oxen were Fey and Femin, of whom are the plain of Fey and the plain of Femin. Uh, those were two faithful oxen. Tork Tria was king of the boars, from, that's B-O-A-R-S, from whom is Mag Treerna. Kirba was king of the Wethers, from whom is Mag Kirba. Ma, son of Umar, was the Druid. Bao, 
B-A-D-B, and Maha, the Moragu, and Anon, of whom are the two paps of Anna in Luachar, were the three daughters of Ernmas, the she-farmer. I better just stop for a second just to make sure I'm not missing really important commentary here. I know a lot of people are commenting. David Ebel says, Talchu's sacrifice, the death of the fur volug slash hunter gatherers being replaced by the herder farmer de Danans, chariot Indo Indo Europeans, seeds of history and myth. Well, I firmly believe that the myth contains the seeds and the kernels of history, of course, absolutely. So you could be onto something there, David. It's something very interesting that we'll discuss in another episode pertaining to uh, the Milesians arriving and taking over from the Dedanans and how that might be reflected in, in archaeology and uh, genetics. Muvanui says, Bequila and Dianan did some pretty impressive fighting, moving earth and trees, I think, during the battle. Yeah, brilliant stuff. Ben Von Eich, we need to get back to the real, to real, the real ancient equality again, to get the earth and all back on track. Correct. Oh, yes, in relation to the tribe of Dan, uh, that, that probably desire, did, 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 that, that whole thing about the British Israelites and the tribe of Dan probably deserves an episode all on its own. They are not the tribe of Dan. At no point anywhere in the literature does it say they're the tribe of Dan. Uh, that is the result of a British Israelite incursions into our stories. And there's absolutely nothing of substance there, I can tell you. The reason they were called Tua de Danan was because Tua de meant the children of God. And if the scribes left that in the manuscripts, what people would be reading was that the Tua de Danan were basically the children of Israel, that they were the Tua de, the children of God, you know, the, 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 the tribes. And that's not what was meant. In fact, they were the children of the goddess Danu. Uh, or, or or Anna, uh, what what is her name given there? Uh, how is it given? Sorry, I just uh, in, on the previous page. Anan, A N A N N. The the two are they Danan. Um, uh, Megan says some fringe archaeologists have linked them to the Tua. I don't even think they're fringe archaeologists. A lot of these people aren't scholars at all. It is not just a tenuous link. It, it is entirely fabricated. So anywhere you read that Tua de Danon are the tribe of Dan, run in panic. The same people who say the Tua de Danon are the lost tribe of Dan are the same people who say Jeremiah was in Ireland. And the reason you know is because loads of people in Ireland are called Jerry. I kid you not. Please don't go there. Do not go there. But we will perhaps address that in a future episode. Yeah, Elizabeth Mark says, no, Danu is an own goddess, not related to Diana. She is once mentioned as the mother of the Morrigan sisters uh, uh, and once her sister. Correct. Uh, and Aaron is suggesting that she could send something to the MI community page. Yeah, don't forget if you're on here on the, on the Mythical Ireland page that there's a separate Mythical Ireland community on Facebook where people can interact. You can't post on this page. You can only comment on my posts. But on the Mythical Ireland community, you can all interact with each other. So if you've got stuff to share, share it on there, by all means. And you're more than welcome to do that. Goinu, or Godnu, the smith, Lukna, the carpenter, Krejna, the right, Dian Kecht, the leech, or the, the healer. To memorialize that, the poet Yuki sang the following composition. And there's a separate poem, which we won't read now. Nuadu was 20 years in the kingship of Ireland till he fell in the last battle of Moitura at the hands of Balor. 40 years had Lu, so this is just repeating or summarising, till the three sons of Kermat slew him at Coim Drum, that is in Ishnach. Uh, and of course, that is the story, if you've ever been to the hill of Ishnach, that Marty Mulligan, uh, who is one of the guides there, tells so well and so entertainingly uh, that 
uh, the three sons of Kermit, Slulu at Ishnak, and that Lochlu is the place where he uh, was apparently killed. And there's even a mound or a cairn uh, up at Ishnak, which is said to be, uh, is it, what's it called? Karnlu or Dualu or something like that, uh, where Lu is supposed to be buried. 80 to the Dagda, that is 80 years, till he died of the gory javelin wherewith Kellen gave him a mortal wound in the great battle of Moitura. So uh, the Dagda died of a gory javelin wound, which is very interesting because uh, we were talking, weren't we, um, about what sort of games. Wasn't that yesterday we were talking about what sort of games we might play in the Henges uh, and at the assemblies? And there was a suggestion, I think I started it, uh, about the possibility of blood sports. And there was even a suggestion that there might have been javelin games and, and all that sort of thing. Well, there you go. There isn't, it isn't all that outlandish a suggestion, you know. Dalbyth after the Dagda, 10 years in the Kingdom of Ireland. So it didn't keep going up exponentially. Nu Nuadu, 20. Lu, 40. Uh, Dagda, 80. And Dalbyth, 10 in the Kingdom of Ireland, until he and his son, Olaf, fell at the hands of Kaikar, son of Nawa, brother of Nechton. Uh, Fiechna, son of Delbaith, took the kingship after his father another ten years, till Fiechna and the six sons of Olaf fell at the hands of Ogan of Invermore. Bloody hell, people falling at people's hands. There was an awful lot of slaughter in uh, the mythological past. Twenty-nine years had the grandsons of the Dagda in the kingship of Ireland, to wit, Macoel, Macecht, Magrania. They divided Ireland into three parts between them and left no sons at all. Sehor, Tehor and Kehor were their names. To them came the Gael, so that they fell at the hands of the sons of the of Mill of Spain, avenging Ich and Cúlnge and Fuat, those were the three sons of Bregan who were killed in the first uh, Milesian expedition. And we'll cover all that in a future episode. So to memorize that, the historian Tanija sang the following poem. And that's poem number L-I-V. And so if I can just refer to that, maybe we'll read a tiny little bit of poetry and see how long it is for a start. It might be a really, really long one. L-I-V, it's got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine... Nine quatrains so far. Yeah, we might read that because it's a summary. There's 11 quatrains. The two of the under obscurity, a people without a covenant of religion. Again, you can imagine that that's an incursion by the, the uh, Christian scribe. Whelps of the wood that has not withered, people of the blood of Adam's flesh. And here we go is a, a distinct effort being made on the part of the chronicler to make the Daedamans related to uh, uh, humans uh, and to connect them uh, with the history as laid down in uh, the Bible. Lisa Murray is saying, thank you from New Zealand. A very good morning to you, Majin Ma. Lisa, you're very welcome along. Nobles yonder of the strong people, people of the withered summit, let us relate in the course in which we are, their periods in their kingdom. A space of seven years of Nuadu, stoble, noble stately, stoble nately, noble stately, over the fair haired company, the rule of the man large breasted, flaxen maned, before his coming into Ireland. In my chura, heavy with doom, where fell a champion of the battle. From the white defender of the world, his arm of princedom was lopped off. <laughs> Choice language here. Seven years of, or just certainly descriptive language, seven years of breast, which was not a white space. Through its fair prospect for the song abbot, in the princedom over the plain, generous in nuts, till the arm of Nuadu was healed. Nuadu, after that, 20 years, he brought the fairy folk a hosting to Lou, the spear slaughterous, was made king, the many crafted who cooled not. Forty to Lou, it was balanced in the kingship over the palace of Bamba. He reached no celestial bed of innocence. Eighty to the Dagda. 
ten years to vehement Dalbyth, till one wise in course and royal arrived, faultless over the brink of the ocean, ten other to Fiachna. Twenty-nine years I have proclaimed it over every peace land in Ireland, in the kingdom over Banba enduringly great, had the grandsons of Dagda skilled in Densheng, and that is not translated, that's interesting, in the Irish Densheng, D-E father N-S-E-N-G, and it's not translated. Uh, perhaps there wasn't a translation. The grandsons of the Dagda skilled in Densheng, whatever Densheng is, Katrina, perhaps uh, you might have a suggestion. Thereafter, the sons of Mill came. They arrived to redden them, children of the great hero who burst out of Spain without growing cold, till the deedful gale wounded them without a troop through their cunning. It is not a matter of fable or of folly. That small was the weakness of the Tua. And that's how that poem ends. Now, there follows what appears to be a genealogy. Nuadu arach lov mach echti nek etalau nek ordum nek aldui nek teat nek thyborn nek ena. And that basically means Nuadu, Aragadlov, son of Ektok, son of Etherlam, son of Ordam, son of Aldwi. And it's just a long list of names. Son of, son of, son of, son of, son of. Uh, and so it appears uh, that, yes, the rest of the tale appears, it would appear, or quite a lot of it, is basically a genealogy or a list of the descendants. But before we get on to the second redaction, and I don't intend to read all three redactions. There is a section here after a poem. Bridget the poetess, daughter of the Dagda, she it is who had Fea and Femen, the two oxen of Dil, from whom are named Mag Fay and Mag Femen. Uh, so this is Bridget, who we spoke about uh, in, oh, what episode was it? Actually, something I forgot to do. Just to paste in the, the link where you can see all of the previous episodes together. And I'm going to do that now. There it is on YouTube and here on Facebook under the video. It should appear now in a moment as a comment where you can see all the previous episodes of Live Irish Myths, all 46 of them embedded in the one page. Uh, Bridget. Uh, episode 39, which was, yeah, which was a week ago or a little bit over a week ago. Episode 39, Bridget, Goddess and Saint. Bridget the Poetess, Bridget Banfili, daughter of the Dagda, she it is who had Fay and Femen, the two oxen of Dil, who, from whom are named Mag Fay and Mag Femen. With them was Threa, king of the swine, from whom is Threherne. Among them were heard three demon voices in Ireland after plunder, to, to wit, whistling and outcry and groaning. Three Goha, G O T H A, Giaval, D I B D I A B A I L. Among the two of the Danon, there came shouting and outcry and barking, shouting for fear of capture, barking against mischief and plunder, outcry for a fitting lamentation of their affliction. And there's a question mark after that. These are the two of the Danon, and there follows a long list of names. So again, uh, more of it. Um, yes. And then we're on to the second reduction. So let me just quickly read, okay, a little section. I know we're uh, we're an hour we're uh, an hour and thirteen in, uh, so we won't be staying too long. But just let, allow me to read a little bit of the beginning of the second redaction to give you an idea of the similarities. The taking of the two of the Danon here below, the progeny of Behach, son of Yubernel, the soothsayer, son of Nemed, were in the northern islands of the world, learning the devil's druidry. <laughs> the devil, of course, is added in there till they were expert in every craft of their pagan cunning and in every diabolic art of druidry. 
And there they were between the Athenians and the Philistines. And there used to be a battle every day between the Athenians and the Philistines at that time till the Athenians dwindled away, all but a small remnant. For the Tuatidanon used to fashion demons in the bodies of the Athenians so that they used to come every day to battle. To the Philistines that was a marvel, and they came to the Druid who was in the land, and they said unto him, We marvel that the men whom we slay every day and every night should be the, f the first to come to battle with us on the morrow. Their elder gave them counsel, saying unto them, Take with you skewers of hazel, and quicken to the battle tomorrow. And if the battle break before you, thrust in those skewers behind the necks of the men whom you shall slay. If they be demons, they shall become heaps of worms. Thereafter the Philistines came to the battle on the morrow, and it broke before them. And they thrust those points in behind the necks of the men whom they slew, and they became heaps of worms on the morrow. After that, the uh, Philistines assembled together to slay the two of the Danon. These came in terror before them, and by their druidry and fightings they fashioned demons, and the first company of them came to Ireland afterwards as the Tua Dei, and their origin is unknown whether they were of demons or of men, which is saying exactly in a roundabout way what the first redaction had said. Howbeit, they are of the progeny of Behach, son of Yarbanel, the soothsayer. In this wise they came. Coda is getting rather excited out there. He doesn't like when a cat walks across the wall. He considers the top of the wall part of his territory and he guards it quite zealously. In this wise they came, without chips or barks, in clouds of fog over there, over the air by their might of druidry. And here's where we get all the suggestions that the two of the Danans are aliens. And so they descended on a mountain of Connacht Nirain in Connacht. There is the course and the cause of their emprise after their education. Others say that it, it was in ships they all came. However, they had completed all their education among the Greeks, interestingly, not in the Northern Isles of the world, according to the first redaction. And they took territory and estate in the north of Alba at Dor and Ordor for seven years, Nuadu being king over them. And they came to Ireland on Monday, the Calends of May, in ships and vessels. And that is very, very interesting. The, the Danans came to Ireland at Bialtana. And what do you know, when the Milesians came to Ireland and when they were able to make a successful landing, they did so also at Bialtana on the Calends of May. And they burned their ships and advanced unperceived by the Furvolug till they landed on Schlieve Iaren. And they formed a fog for three days and three nights over sun and moon and demanded battle or kingship of the Furvolug. And the Battle of Moitura was fought between them, as we have said above, and afterwards 100,000 of the Furvolug were slaughtered there. Thereafter, the Tuatadanon took the kingship of Ireland. It is they who brought with them the stone of Fal, which was in Chower, uh, Inish Fal, uh, at Ut Kinej Kekinet. Okay, blah, blah, blah. There were four cities in which the Tuatadanon were acquiring knowledge, namely Phalius, Gorius, Phineas, Murius. Four sages who were in those cities, Morphessa, who was in Phalius, Esros in Gorius, Usicius in Phineas, Semias in Murius. These are the four sa sages with whom the two of the acquired knowledge and, pardon me, and science. So there, it, it separates here. From Gorius was brought the spear of Lu, and no victory could be won against it, nor against him who had it in hand. From Phineas was brought the sword of Nuadu Aragatlov, and no man escaped from it when it was drawn from its battle scabbard. From Murius was brought the cauldron of the Dogda. No company would go from it unsatisfied. From Folius was brought the stone of Fall to Chower, and it used to cry in their time under every king that should take Chower. Thence is Inish Fall named. So you can see how uh, that the, the, the redactions are similar, uh, but they do, of course, differ in some of the detail. Now, what I wanted to say uh, was this. If you are reading any kind of uh, uh, 
a modern translation or a work of nonfiction, uh, especially a work of nonfiction, uh, in relation to the Tuatha Dé Danann and in relation to the Laura Gawala, etc., etc. I think it would, uh, I think it, it would serve you very well uh, to have a copy of the source material available uh, if you're studying it and if you're interested in it, uh, so that you're not thrown off the scent by those who would make suggestions about what uh, the various um, uh, symbolism and metaphors and analogies of the myths could possibly mean. It is always helpful to have the original source material. So you can see exactly what the words were. You can refer to the Irish. You can refer to McAllister's uh, translation of that. Decide whether, if you're scholarly enough and you know your stuff, decide whether you think that that is a fitting uh, and... Uh, um, appropriate translation for the term or the words etc uh, in hand but always i think it is advisable to refer to the original source material because what happens is one person makes a false claim so uh, an example of that and again this is something we'll cover in later episodes an example of that is when james ferguson in his book about rude stone monuments asserted that Cairn T at Loch Crew was the burial place of Olaf Fola, about which there was no tradition in the area. And uh, himself and uh, Conwell ridiculed the story of the, the Kalyak, uh, which was in fact the indigenous story and probably the story going right back to the Stone Age about the place. Um, that story has been repeated ad nauseum. And I constantly see websites uh, online where it is asserted as a fact and refer and there are references to books saying all of Fola, uh, you know, it, it is his uh, um, a throne uh, that is at Cairn T rather than the hag's chair. Uh, so always be very, very careful to refer to the source material or to to be diligent enough to want to go back to it, uh, even though it can be quite opaque at times, and it definitely can be that. Some of it, as I say, is clearly uh, uh, the work of the, the, the Christian scribe who, who, whose efforts, uh, as McAllister says in his introduction, are to cover over uh, the fact that these were, in fact, uh, pre-Christian deities. And as deities... Um, uh, they would present, I suppose, a challenge to uh, the new faith as it was strongly becoming uh, established in Ireland. And in fact, by the time of the big monasteries, of course, uh, religion and politics had become so mixed up uh, that uh, several of the uh, uh, the kings ended up becoming abbots as well. And the kings were the ones who granted the land uh, to the abbots of the, uh, the large monasteries. Anyway, um, that has absolutely flown for me that time. Um, I think, uh, like we've only gotten not even halfway through the second redaction and there is a third redaction. Uh, if you want, we can come back to it. Um, I'm not sure if we've covered it off sufficiently. Uh, certainly we are going to do an episode, uh, covering, uh, we'll probably do one episode covering the Partholonians and the Nemedians in the Lower Gawala. We'll do an episode on the Fervolog and we'll do an episode on the Milesians, a separate episode on Aragin, uh, which somebody has called for. So there's lots and lots pertaining to Lower Gawala, the Book of Invasions, that we can come back to. Uh, Katrina says, don't get me started on church power, bon secours or sans secours and stealing our money still. At least we have these records as corrupted as they are, says Maeve Fina Callahan. Yeah, that's a very interesting and a very valid point that what you have to do, obviously, is tease out, uh, uh, you know, in the best manner possible is to tease out uh, the nuggets that are the original material and not, you know, to try and uh, see through not necessarily discard completely, but to certainly see through uh, those embellishments or, or additions or downright lies told by the church authorities in the in the retelling. So there you go. Yes, let's go. Let's go back to it. Says Wendy. Well, we what we can do is um, we can do an episode in which I'll just read the second and third redactions. 
Uh, we'll be repeating ourselves, but look, it's good material. Uh, uh, I'm reminded there, there are several things in there that I have to go back to uh, and that I have to sort of memorize and put in here uh, in order that I might write future blog posts and future book chapters. Because there's very, very important information there, uh, you know, and stuff that, to be honest with you, until I've read something uh, maybe 10 or a dozen times, I tend to forget nuggets of information unless I have them written and unless I have them noted carefully. And I don't always do that, you know, as I often do with books where I have post-it notes sticking out the side of them and I have pencil marks in the margins. Sometimes I don't transfer them into note form and then how they get onto into book form. Anyway, uh, that's another episode that we can do is the process by which the information gets from the books into uh, one of my books uh, in other words how i do or how i go about it maybe that's something we could do barbara says thank you for your insurance on checking original source material also if in a foreign language check more than one translation exactly now as it happens with some of the translations there is only one uh, in some cases there are several Sirsha says, on well, Sean Gael Gotchen, Neil Sirsha, I am actually in the currently Tommy Folum Gael Arish. I'm relearning Irish, having not really spoken it since I left school. It's something I'm quite ashamed of, I can tell you. Uh, but uh, Katrina says, no, Brown, there's no need to be ashamed about it. Uh, but I feel that in order to take my own uh, scholarship further, I, I, I need to at least be able to speak modern Irish. Uh, and then uh, in that case, uh, I'll be able to go back and, and do more scholarly work on uh, maybe trying to, like um, Morgan Daimler is self-taught. Uh, she taught herself early Irish, which is brilliant, you know. Uh, Jennifer Foley says, perfect timing. My pizza is here. Good night, all. Enjoy your pizza, Jennifer, and a very good night to you. I'd love to hear about your process, says Maeve Fina Callahan. I will take a note of that. OG in Callahan. Okay. Good stuff. There's a G in Drahada, but Drahada never gets the G pronounced. But not anybody who hasn't been always says Drogida. Uh, Henry says, fantastic episode. Thank you, our, uh, thank you, Anthony. A pleasure as always to... Uh, Goromaha, good Henry. And it's always a pleasure to have you along. Alex says, thank you again for tonight. Love the Book of Invasions. What do you make of Jim Fitzpatrick's version? Has a lot of art too. Yeah, Jim Fitzpatrick is a wonderful artist and is tremendously interested in all the ancient lore. He's fabulous. He really is. He's a great ambassador uh, for Irish mythology and, you know, uh, uh, well, I suppose by extension, Irish culture. Rosalie Reeves says, would be there with knobs on to hear your process. Well, yeah, that'll, that'll be an interesting episode. You'd be interested in that one, I think, because um, some of it is a little bit, uh, uh, what's the word, unconventional, shall we say. So we'll just add Rosalie Reeves. It's very interesting also. Uh, and uh, Rosalie is watching us on YouTube. Uh, thanks a million tonight. We had lovely, we'd a lovely, uh, we did uh, quite a number of newcomers tonight, and I hope you all enjoyed yourselves, and I hope that you're all made feel welcome, and I hope that the tribe, the growing tribe, um, um, you know, interacted with you and that you want to come back again. Uh, sometimes when I get really bogged down in the reading, I, 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 I miss an awful lot of commentary that sometimes I'm able to uh, answer one by one and sometimes I'm not. So apologies if you asked me something or you made a comment that I didn't reply to. As usual, I have to say, please, if there's something about tonight that you want to comment about or that you want to ask me about or, or that I may be able to give you more information on, drop me an email. My email address is very easy to remember. It's mythicalireland at gmail.com. And I'll type that in as a comment here on Facebook, mythicalireland at gmail.com. And I'll type it in also on uh, YouTube. So send me an email, ask me your question, make your comment uh, by any means. Connor Pockle. Aham Tonachara, could you quickly address the comment I posted earlier? Would love to hear your opinion regarding their arrival and ship burning at Bialtana. Okay, what was your question? Because I thought that we did cover the ship burning and their arrival at Bialtana. I'm not sure exactly. I read some of the ancient Irish lit the Bialtana bonfires to honour the arrival of their gods. The bonfires symbol symbolise the burning of their enormous armada. 
What do you think of this theory? I'm, I'm not familiar with the theory, Connor, but it is very interesting. And indeed, there might be some substance to it. Because as I said, both the Dedanans and the Milesians arrive at Bialtana. Now, the Milesians arrived first at Inverskena, and then they had to come back around and beat the storm and arrive at Inverkulpa. But on their second arrival, which was their successful, their successful incursion or arrival, they were able to make land, and they made land. Our game was the one who made land at the Altona. So that's really, really interesting. Something that I came across uh, in, uh, uh, and again, this is a slight tangent, uh, because I've been doing a little bit of research about a place name, and uh, all will be revealed hopefully this week. Uh, but one of the things I found about Bialtana is that uh, which basically literally means uh, between the two fires of Bialtana, is apparently an Irish saying, which means that you're in a bit of a, a quandary or a dilemma. <laughs> I read that. I think I read that in one of the... I think I read that in, in the O'Donnell folklore, like the modern Irish folklore. I could be mistaken. So bear, bear with me one moment. And I wonder... Uh, that may or may not... This is very tenuous. That may or may, may not relate to what you're asking me about... Um, that the Irish lit the Bialtana bonfires to honour the arrival of their gods. I like that idea. The tradition around Idr Naga, Chinna, Bialtana is that the fires were purification fires that you drove your cattle through to make sure that they weren't going to suffer any, uh, any disease or loss uh, during the coming year, you know? Um, so... Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I wonder, Connor, if... You can do more to give me the source of this claim. I'd like to read it myself. Uh, and this is one of the areas where we have to be very careful. So, Connor, I think you're demonstrating something important here. You're saying that somebody has written that the ancient Irish lit the Bialtana fires to honour the arrival of their gods. Now, I haven't heard that before. Uh, and... <clears throat> I'm not sure that I've seen anything in the mythology that suggests that. So I'd like to know who wrote that in what book, and I'd like to read it myself. And I would like to see what they're basing it on, what the source of it is. But I'm not saying for a second that there's no uh, uh, truth to it uh, or, or, or no substance to it, not at all. Iger ga hine vialtana means in a dilemma. There you go. It's, it's right there on page 97 of o O'Donnell's Folklore. It, you probably won't be able to read You certainly won't be able to read it on Facebook because it's back to front. Idir Gahina Vialtana, in a dilemma. I'll just show the YouTubers that because you might be able to read that. Uh, I think that folklore is the one that is entirely online. Uh, is, is that the one, uh, Katrina Changlin.ie? I think that is the uh, O'Donnell folklore. It is. So I'm going to give you a link to that. So those of you who want uh, to uh, translate Irish words, the, those of you who, like me, uh, don't speak much Irish or enough, don't speak enough Irish, uh, or perhaps those of you who don't speak any at all might be interested in going to this site uh, where you will get uh, a folklore, a modern folklore, uh, which is basically a dictionary. So, uh, Connor, I hope that's answered your question, but uh, certainly I'd love to hear more from you. Send me an email if you figure out where you read that, in what publication or what book or what website did you read that on, because I'd like to know what the source of it is. Vicky Wallace Southerl is saying we'll catch up so on it, so I'm not behind. Hi, Vicky uh, Gilgrich. Eva Anderson, thank you for tonight. As a medieval historian, though my area is material culture in medieval and early mo modern Scandinavia, I'm always grateful when someone is referring people to the original sources. Brilliant stuff. <laughs> Great session, Anthony, says Mariana. Take care, everyone. Pat Rowan, many tribes had this prophecy that if we do not share, it will be lost. That quote that keeps coming back to me, and I don't know what the original source of it was, but I read it in Judith, Judith Nyland's book, um, uh, Legacy of Wisdom. And the quote is, that no tradition dies until the last person who honours it dies. So let's keep it going. Yeah, Katrina is saying, as the cattle went through, it is purification. So it's like another world. Idr Aon is Idr As. Yeah, exactly. The Milesians would have been in front of the fires, thus illuminated, not obscured, says Patricia Healy Sullivan. 
Rowan Grove says, very different. I studied the Scottish Gaelic for several years, and when I tried some incursion into Welsh, discovered there were some cognates, but the orthography is very different. Okay, so I think that's it. Hi, Brazil. Hi, Brazil again. Ikhoa <laughs> Kolosov, says Katrina. Thank you for these. Thank you. Love these stories, says Barb. No problem. Always glad to read them. I'm interested in the area I live in between the Ban River and Loch Ney. Clan Brassel said to be the clan of the people of Bress. Yeah, I don't know much about it, Jim, but um, something that we could maybe do a little bit of research on. Clan, clan Brassel. Yvette Tillema is saying Billa, B-I-L-E, question mark. What is that question, uh, Yvette? Billa being a sacred tree, and I wonder why you're asking, because that is very interesting and pertains to something else that I'm... Uh, that, uh, let's, let's just say that's a little synchronicity. Josephine Meehan, thanks, Anthony. Really enjoyed this. On episode 15 now, brilliant. Lucky you, you have uh, another... What have you got? You have another 30... 32 episodes, 31 to catch up on. Brilliant stuff. Doris O'Hara, thank you, Anthony. Good night. Ihoa. Philo Kernonos Nichols, this has been fascinating. Glad I joined in. Catch you all on the flip flop. Good night, Philo, and thanks for joining us. Definitely have to learn the language, says Michael. Uh, I'm learning on Duolingo. Uh, now I had to pay for that, um, but um, I've been I've been I've been doing lessons every day, um, and to be honest, I'm relearning a lot because a lot of it's coming back to me. Uh, and I think that the more we try to do this with each other, uh, the more it will stay with us. You know, and I'm glad that. You know, some of you who've never spoken Irish uh, are, are, are just learning even a couple of Irish words, which is brilliant because it's all helping to keep it all alive, you know. Anyway, stay safe, everybody. Keep washing your hands and keep uh, your social distancing. Duolingo is free, says Katrina. Mm. Yeah, I know, and and uh, it's allegedly free, but I had to. I, I I had to. I'm pretty sure I had to pay. But uh, anyway, I'll talk to you about that off list. Uh, good night, all. Stay safe and um, uh, stay sane, you know, and keep well so that you can keep coming back for the stories. We'll be back tomorrow evening. I have no idea what tomorrow evening is going to be about, but there are tons and tons of suggestions. Perhaps we'll just carry on, will we? Perhaps we'll just carry on. Um, and then before the end of the week, we will have an episode on Anya. And I know that's a, a, a popular one that plenty of people have uh, suggested that they are uh, enthusiastic about. Uh, Don Hilton, that is very interesting. Send me the details, please. Uh, MythicalIreland at gmail.com. Katrina says, never been sane. So, yeah, maybe we'll get sane for the first time. You never know what this will do to us all. Anyway, uh, and to those of you on uh, YouTube, the four territories, could they equate to the four provinces? Yeah, there's a cosmology there in relation to the division of things, uh, at three and four and five, which is very interesting. Maybe something we can get back to, uh, definitely. Connor says, I, 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 I'll see if I can find where I read it and we'll send it on if I find it. Gora Mila Mahagat Anton. Yeah, thanks, Connor. I really, I'm actually really interested in that. I'd love to know where you read that. If it comes to you, please let me know. Melissa O'Brien, thanks. Really enjoying this series of stories. You're all, you're very welcome. So take it handy, folks, and we'll see you tomorrow. Kolosov August uh, Slonga Fall. And the YouTubers always get the extra couple of seconds. What time? Oh my God! Nine thirty-seven p.m. We've been we've been on for over an hour and a half. Well, I hope you've enjoyed it. But we'll see you again tomorrow night. And don't forget, uh, if you're on YouTube and you're watching this, don't forget to subscribe. <laughs>